And so we are working through the Psalms this morning, and we have to be lighthearted and fun because of what we're dealing with this morning is Psalm 88. Psalm 88. Psalm 88 is considered to be the suffering psalm. As a matter of fact, it's referred to as the darkest psalm in all of the psalms. And uh, there's a reason why we sang Raise a Hallelujah. Uh, There's a reason why we sang those songs that we did, because if you look at Psalm 88, it begins with crying and it ends with the word darkness. As a matter of fact, it's one of those psalms, one of the few psalms that, and David's not the writer is, we're going to talk about the man who is in just a moment, why David commissioned him to write this song. Uh, it's, it's one of the few psalms that, that really doesn't end with hope. A lot of the psalms that David or others might write, it may start, with, start out with a cry and continue somewhat with a plea. But it's, it always it turns and ends with, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. The, the writer of this song expresses that. But again, it's, it's the suffering psalm. And, and about the time I was putting these psalms together, a number of things were happening. So months ago, uh, maybe back in uh, May um, is when I was working on this one. And uh, there were just a number of folks here in the church and just I was talking to and just really going through what you would consider the dark night of the soul. Oswald Chambers, if you're familiar with him, and my utmost for his highest. Uh, he also writes another commentary on the dark night of the soul. And there were just a number of folks that were just felt like they just couldn't push through the darkness. They knew that, that God was in their life. They, they knew that God was part of their life. They knew they were saved. But, man, the darkness that just surrounded them. And I thought, you know, there are a lot of us that are familiar with that. And so I want to to look at Psalm 88 this morning and actually find hope in it, believe it or not, because there is a reason why Haman was commissioned to write this. As a matter of fact, before we really ever get into the the psalm, if you're there, look before verse 1, sort of the explanation. Now watch this. It says, A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. We know about them. Uh, The sons of Korah are the the grandchildren left over from a rebellious faction that rose up against uh, Moses and Aaron and and God had a way with dealing with them. 250 of them uh, were swallowed up by the ground that God opened up. Uh, For some reason, God spared these grandchildren and out of that they became the musicians of worship that they they dedicated themselves to bringing glory and honor to God and not to defy the name and uh, be disobedient to God. But watch this next part. To the choir master, according to Mahaleth, Leoneth. Now, if you let's stop there for just a moment. Imagine the scene where maybe you're watching something on television, and it's let's say I don't know a music award show, and most other songs come out, and it's big fanfare, big lights, upbeat. But there's that, that one song that every once in a while will come out where all the lights go down, right? And the music starts out somber, and there's one guy on a guitar on a stool with just one light around him. This is what this means. So Mahaleleth is literally a guitar stringed instrument. And that next word, Leonoth, literally means the style that it's to be played. So it's, it's almost like this is a guy that they've looked at. His name is Haman. I'm going to tell you about him in just a moment. David looked at him and said, because of what you've been through, this is your story. You need to share this. And you need to write a song that describes your faithfulness, your wisdom, your life. And maybe David, we kind of have an idea that he said that because of the way it's prescribed. I want you to play it this way, and I want it to be arranged by the sons of Kor, but Haman, you need to be the guy that sings this. And so it really is his testimony of his life. So who is this guy Haman? You you see it right here before we ever get into verse 1. It says, a maskil of Haman the Ezrite. Now, a maskil is is a wisdom psalm. So when you hear the word maskil, it literally means wisdom so again, David's coming to him and saying, you, you've got a lot to teach us. And you may not have the most glorious testimony. Yours is probably not fire, fireworks and, and glitter, but yours is a tough one. But there are a lot of people, trust me, Haman, is maybe what I envision David saying, there's a lot of people that experience the dark night of the soul, and they need to hear this. Now this guy, Haman, who, who was he? He's, there's, there's a lot mentioned about him actually um, in the scriptures. He is, he is likened to the wisdom of, of Solomon. As a matter of fact, some would even say in the Bible that it's mentioned that he is wiser than Solomon. Um, he's the grandson of Samuel. He's a godly father. I mean, the sons that he's a part of and the lineage that he comes from, he's a godly man. He's a songwriter, obviously, as you see here. He was a Levite. 
We know that he had extreme influence uh, in the time of David and Solomon. So during both of those reigns, this was a, a gentleman that they probably went to and sought after his wisdom. Because you've been around those people, right, that, that are on the mountaintop. And we, and, and we want to be around them like, man, I want to be there. Te-. But you've also been around those people that have really, as we would say, the school of hard knocks, but even harder knocks here. There, there's, there's those people that you just know, wow. There's depth to their speech. There's depth to their prayer. You can tell that they've crossed a lot of rivers. You can tell that a lot of rain has poured down on them. You can tell that that God has fashioned them and it's been difficult for them, but you still look at them and if you didn't know their testimony, you would never have known that they had experienced so much. This was Haman. And so we're we're hearing words from a man today who literally is it's, it's a wisdom psalm. So it's, it's for those of us, and we've all been there, that go through those dark nights of the soul, whether it's an unexplained death, whether it's an, you don't understand the circumstances, whether, it, whether it's none of that, but you just all of a sudden just feel like, God, maybe my Christian walk or my Christian life is at a standstill for just a moment. You're asking God, why me? Why now? Why this? And everything within you is just crying out like God just... Here's literally what he's saying in, in a sentence. Haman is literally saying, God, break the silence. You've been there. And you, you, I can hear the, mm. you know what it's like to spend a sleepless night just asking God, God, break the silence. That's what he's saying. And it's interesting, and Pastor Michael brought this out to me, of all the Psalms, many of them, weeks in advance, the sermon was just downloading. I could not write it fast enough. This one I was stuck on for over two weeks. I just sat there. I just sat there and sat there. And I meet with Pastor Michael every Monday and every Wednesday. And we go over worship. And when I was sharing that with him, he goes, well, maybe God's sort of taking you through what Haman went through. You were just sort of felt like you were stuck. And I thought, wow, spot on. So this psalm is for all of us that have ever felt like, I need, God, I need you to break the silence. I need to hear from you. I don't know why me, why now, why this. There's so many things in my life that I don't understand And God, I need to hear from you this morning. So let's just walk through and just read Psalm 88. It'll take us just a minute, but I think it's critical to read all of it so you can hear it. Now remember, this is a song being sung by a guy on a stool with a spotlight on him when everything else around him is dark. And he's playing it with a stringed instrument to convey the tone of wisdom. Like, learn from me. O Lord, God of my salvation. Let me just stop right there. I think it's so important that that's where he starts. Because, listen, this, this is even before you ever get into the message. Listen, this is something that you and I have to constantly remind ourselves. When the dark night happens, there are those times when, when, when we don't realize just how much we need God until God is all we have. Right? And there's a, there's a reason why we stress the importance of knowing that you belong to Christ. There's a reason why we every Sunday we give an invitation to come to Christ. There's a reason why we want you to make sure that God is your Father, heaven is your home, and Christ is your Savior. There's a reason why I I want to be, when I explain the gospel, I want to be as clear as I can be that it's not some ethereal thing like, well, God's always been there with me and I can feel Him here or there. No, 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 no. You need to know that the Spirit of God is indwelling you based upon your confession and repentance of sin and absolute need to call upon Him as your Savior that if it wasn't for God, you would be absolutely lost in eternal darkness. Now, why is that so important? Because lost are saved. You're going to go through a dark night. And the first thing that he knows, and the only thing that he knows, in the midst of darkness, is God, at least I know I'm saved. That is the only thing he knows. I mean, right, that ought to be enough said. Sermon done, we're, we're over. Pastor Michael, come back up and sing eight more songs. I mean, right? That ought to be enough said right there. But this is where he starts out. Oh, Lord God of my salvation. Listen, before we ever get into the message, you need to know that you belong to Christ because there's going to be a time when you need to know that Christ belongs to you. That's how you get through the dark night. I cry out. See, it starts with crying and it ends with darkness. I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Like, God, break the silence. Please hear me. Incline your ear to hear my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws, uh, my life draws near to Sheol. 
I am counted among those who go down to the pit. It's interesting, we went there in Israel, we think, and when we were in Israel, it's, and this is where I sort of got inspired to preach this psalm, we went to what they call the actual pit. And, and the only way that you arrive in the pit is you're let down by a, a rope down into this hole where there's absolute darkness. And it's where prisoners were known to be held, and there were Byzantine crosses uh, all, etched in all over the wall. And, and our guide, um, George, said, we think most often what they would, would, would quote or sing while they were in this pit was Psalm 88. And so it's amazing when you, when you actually you're travel there and you're there and you get to hear that and experience that, that this is probably what happened the end of verse 4. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies upon me, heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. Selah. In other words, he, he had to pause for a moment. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I will call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Let me think about that. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Wow. Wow. Now, now you think in reading that, that 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 he would sort of end with hope, but stop. This to me is brilliant. It's, It's inspired that David would ask him to write such a psalm. Because I don't know about you, but I've had prayers that end like that. I don't know about you, but I've cried out like, God. And sometimes all I could ever pray was just, God. Right? Like, why me? Why now? Why this? Or why aren't you breaking the silence? Why can't I hear your voice? I know from having done this so long that many people actually walk away from the faith because during the silence, they don't think they hear the voice of God. And David says, Haman, you've got to share this. You've got to share your wisdom. So there are a number of things, really two, but we expound on them a lot, of what we learn from this. So first of all, let's look at his suffering. Here's what, he, here's what he declares, okay? So there's a number of things I want you to gain from this. Number one, it's okay to declare this. Remember, God gave you your emotions. It's okay to give your emotions back to God. It's okay to express that to him. But here's what he's expressing. He basically believes, number one, that he has no future. Number two, he believes he, he has no friends. He, he, he says that. Number three, he believes he has no foundation. Like, God, I'm just hanging out here. Nothing is really settled and... I don't understand where I'm at. Number four, he believes he has no faith. So here's the good news. Don't deny it. Don't try to skirt around it. Here's the good news. If you've ever felt like these four things, you're probably among some of the wisest people ever mentioned in the Bible. Isn't that cool? That if you've ever felt like that, and I know you have felt like that, maybe not all four at once, but maybe one of the four, Maybe two of the four, whatever. But I know at some point you felt like, God, break the silence. God, answer me. God, let me hear from you. God, why this? Why now? What's going on? When can I hear from you? I feel like everything has abandoned me. I have no foundation. And maybe at the last, you just maybe doubted your salvation. This is why I think Haman wrote that. And this is why I think he started the way he did in in verse 1. So here's the question. Ever been there? Have you ever been there? And it's okay to admit yes. So how, how, do, how do we move on from that? What, what do we learn? How, let me show you how to handle the dark nights of the soul, uh, according to Haman. Number one, this is what we learn from Haman. This, this is the hope that we find in him. Number one, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Every week I, I meet with a family, and this week I did again. I met with a family and, and came in and were just like, what do we do about this situation? And I said, let me tell you my story. And I'm still learning it. I'm still developing in it. 
When I was first called into ministry, I would hear guys that are now my age, um, you know, I would hear them say, prayer, prayer in ministry. And there was part of me that was like, yeah, we need to pray. But there was the other part of me that was like, I'm 25 years old, let's just ride this horse. Like, right? Like, let's just go. I mean, I, I can do this without prayer. If you, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, we can do this. You're just old and you got to pray. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not old. I don't have to pray. I mean, that was sort of my attitude at 25. You, you know what I'm saying. But if I've learned one thing and one thing about ministry in, this, in life, it's this. Prayer absolutely works. Prayer is by far our greatest weapon, our greatest friend. I mean, this week alone, at, at the same time, and it's, it's amazing how God did it. I think he always does this in, in, in the development of the sermons and so forth. And so as I'm meeting with this family... There's another family, and they're saying, we need God to do this. And when we go into the court, we need to hear this answer. When I go to this person, I need to hear this answer. And God, we need you to do this. So as I'm meeting with this family, this other family calls me up and says, Pastor, before you won't believe, before we could ever get our words out of the mouth, the judge ruled exactly what we prayed for. And before we could ever go to this other person, the, the, the person just said, do this. And so I'm sitting there telling this family, look, I'm telling you right now, right, right now, here's your story and here's the bookends of it. I'm telling you to go to prayer and I'm telling you, this family went to prayer and they saw this happen. And, and, and you, just, you just see the light of hope come into somebody's eyes when they realize prayer absolutely works. So here's what we know. Don't stop praying. He says it, verse 1, verse 2, verse 9, verse 13, over and over and over. You hear him, I pray, I pray, I pray. So here's what we know. Number one, what did he, what did he do? Number one, he prayed continually. He prayed continually. You see, here's a theme that we're learning from the Bible. We learned it last week and we're learning it this week. That two things need to be constantly on our prayer watch because they're in our heart. One is praise and number two is prayer. When those things dominate our life, it honestly helps you and I function more as we should as a believer in Christ. It's whenever other things are on our lips or when prayer's not in our heart... Other conversations going to take over, other hopes and dreams and us aspirations. But when we can fill our mouth with both prayer and praise, things change. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Now, hopefully, you know, this doesn't always mean with your eyes closed, like when you're driving. Okay, you know, it, 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 you don't always have to be on your knees. You don't always have to have your eyes closed. It, the, the word here that he's trying to convey is it's a constant muttering. It's a constant muttering. Now, you can go back and look this up, or now you don't have to go back and look it up. You can Google it now, right? When I first started preaching three times on a Sunday early in the ministry, my voice began to fail. And I didn't have good health habits back then. I would drink a two liter of Coke as an appetizer before you know, the meal. And, and I was destroying my vocal cords. One of our secretaries had her master's degree in speech therapy. And she would hear me on Monday morning, and she would say, um, Pastor Ron, your, your voice sounds horrible. I'm like, I know, I'm tired. She goes, no, it's not about speaking. She says, your voice can handle speaking that many times. And she, she began to ask about diet and so forth, blah, blah, blah. And anyway, she fixed it. But here's one of the things she said. She goes, you need to know this about your tongue and your voice box. It never stops moving. Your voice box is constantly making a continual hum. Even when you're not talking, there's wind that's going through your voice box, and it's a continual sound. My mind immediately went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. This idea of con con to, to pray continually literally means that you're continually making this hum. You're, you're continually making this constant request. Sometimes it doesn't have words. Sometimes it doesn't even have an end result. It may not even have a request. You may not even know where to begin. But you just know, i got to talk to somebody, so God, I'm going to talk to you, Right? Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Watch this. Be patient in tribulation, but be constant in prayer. And by the way, if we were to put reverse this verse in reverse, if I'm constant in prayer, it'll help me be patient in tribulation, which will allow me to rejoice in hope. It's, it's a formula, right? A lot of times if you'll just put a verse in reverse, it'll help you understand sort of how it builds. And that's one of them that, that you can do that. He prayed continually. Number two, and I love this. He prayed emotionally. He prayed emotionally. Now, it's interesting, the word cry that he uses actually means shriek. So I know when you and I first read this, we, we see tears. But it's almost like he has no more tears. 
and, 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 and the extent of what he wants to express his emotions is so much more than just a bodily function of tears. He's literally shrieking. You know, you've been in a store or outdoors and it's that childlike scream that comes across, whether it's a shriek of joy or, 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 or fear. And it all kind of makes us kind of tense up our shoulders and look around like, wow, what was that? That's what he's expressing. This is the tone of which he's trying to say, God, break the silence. I mean, can't you, can you now feel it? Can you hear it? And this is why I say to you, listen, God gave you your emotions. It's okay to give your emotions back to God. This is why it's so important to have sort of a, a prayer closet um, or a time that you can set aside. Thankfully, I have that here. You know, I, I have an office, but it has a window. And sometimes I don't want people to see how goofy I look when I'm doing, when I'm praying. So I go into the other little office and I get really goofy in there. You need a place where you can get goofy before God is what I'm trying to say. You know, just say, okay, God, this is going to get messy, but you want to see messy. Listen to Psalm chapter 56 and verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings. Anybody toss and turn in their sleep this week? Anybody ever battle the sheets? Like, <laughs> right? You know, a battle the blankets and a battle the sheets. You're just tossing and turning. You have put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Meaning, he knows they're in his book. What is, the, what is this verse telling us? God actually keeps a journal on your emotions. God knows the tears. I mean, it's not that he just knows your emotions, but God sees the tossing in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit, in your bed, in your relationships. He sees the tears, not just of the face, but of the heart. And he goes, are they not in your book? He, he's not asking them, are they? It's sort of rhetorical. He knows they're recorded because of what he just said. Again, another verse in reverse. Uh, you can put that back is, is what he's saying. God, I know you've recorded my emotions. And God wants to hear that. Listen, get over this idea that, that, that God doesn't want to hear your emotions. Because here's what happens. <clears throat> God gave us our emotions. But as I've said before, your emotions are probably the most shallowest part of who you are if you only live by your emotions. The more you learn to give your emotions back to God, God sort of teaches us how to refilter those emotions and how to respond appropriately. You see, for people that haven't learned to do that, they say statements like this. Well, I'm just going to tell you how I feel. Well, you get what you get from me. That's actually not a mature response. It really is. A mature response is, I've thought, of, but before I put my mouth in gear, I'm going to engage my mind to think about what comes out, right? That's sort of more of an emotional. This is what he's saying about emotions. He's basically saying, God, I, I just need to get those out to you because what, why, the why, I, I need to get them out. I need to hear back from you how to appropriately respond and handle these emotions. But if you don't ever let these emotions out of a bottle, God can't put them in his bottle. All right? So give them back to God. He prayed continually. He prayed emotionally. Number three, he prayed, now watch this, intelligently. He prayed intelligently. How do we know that? Verse 1. He directed his prayer to the Lord, and he uses the word Jehovah. He uses the word Jehovah. Again, this is that, that, that name, Jesus. It, it's, it's the one, Yeshua. It, it literally means salvation, which is why he says, O oh Lord my God, the God of my salvation. He, he, he knows how to intelligently direct that. He doesn't just start out his prayer, hey, if there's a big man upstairs. Hey, if, you know, God, if you're out there, the one that I say is kind of all around me all the time, if, if that's you and you're listening. No, he knows exactly who he's directing it to because he knows exactly who he needs to hear from. There's a statement, it's in a country song, and if I get it right, help me if I don't get it right. It goes like this, if you don't learn to stand for something, you'll... Okay, well, let's put a spin on that. If you don't learn to talk to someone, you'll never know who to hear from. If you don't ever know who to talk to, you won't ever know who to hear from. Right? If I just cast it out there to the universe, you're aware that the universe has a lot of voices, right? <laughs> Friends, opinions, literature, television, media. The, the world has its own system of thought. So if I just cast it out there to the universe, right? If I'm praying to Mother Earth and holding a crystal and hugging a rock, if I just throw it out there to the universe, well, guess what I'm going to hear back from? I'm going to hear inappropriately from a rock. I don't, want to, I don't want that, you know? Pet rock kind of thing in the late 70s, 80s. That's 
We don't want that. Uh, if I know who I'm praying to, I know who to listen for. This is why he prayed intelligently. He knew where to direct his prayer. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. This is my verse uh, when I was very first called into ministry. It's on a lot of plaques uh, in my office because a lot of people call this God's phone number, Jeremiah 33.3. He literally tells you what number to call. Call to me and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and hidden, hidden things that you have not known. That's what Haman's asking. God, I'm in the dark. I'm in a pit. There's no way out. I was let in down by a rope. I don't know what I'm doing here. I need you to show me how to get the way out. Here it is. Regardless of what the problems of life appear to be to our troubled minds, they are never what they seem. You need to get that. Let me read that one more time. Regardless of what the problems of life appear to be to our troubled minds, they are never what they seem. Why? Because remember, we live in a world that operates by a different philosophy. And we are constantly trying to reorient ourselves, which is what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We are constantly trying to reorient ourselves to the appropriate signal, the appropriate thought, the appropriate philosophy. If I'm not doing that, then I'm opening myself up to hearing other things. And so you and I can go through these dark moments. And you know what it's like to be in the dark. Man, it's so funny how God does this before the sermon. So when I get up in the morning, nobody else is up on Sunday mornings. And I don't want to wake Raina up. So when I get up, you know, I, I kind of feel my way to the bathroom. But I leave part of a bathroom light on and when I come out. But when I come out of the light and into the darkness, you know what I mean? It's like, whoa, where am I? But I found that when I'm coming out of darkness and I see light, it's a lot easier to navigate my way. Simple, simple theology. Right, So if I know the light that I'm headed, I am constantly having to reorient myself to the light so I can navigate the dark. If I'm walking away from the light, it's difficult to navigate the dark. Know the light and see the light, which is Christ. Call to me and answer me, and I will basically make things clear to you. So here's what he, he went through in, in this, why we say don't stop praying. Because he, he lists these, now watch this in your notes. He, often what he, what he says here is this, things appear to him, number one is extreme. He uses the words in the depth of the pit, Psalm 88, verse 6. They appear to be inexplicable. He says that in verse 6 as well, in the regions dark. They appear to be humiliating. He says in the regions deep and dark. They appear to be severe, verse 7. He says your wrath lies heavy upon me. And what he means by that, by the way, it's almost like a foreshadowing of when Christ is hanging on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there's nothing more darker to a follower of Christ than to feel the perceived silence of God. And that's what he's expressing here. Number five, he says they appear to be exhaustive. Like, God, seriously? Wave after wave, darkness after darkness, moment after moment. When's it going to stop? Because he says, you overwhelm me with your wave. But let, you have to know the Word of God, which is why you, you never take a text out of context and use it for a pretext, okay? You have to understand the whole story of the Word of God, what they really are. They are not extreme, but actually light. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we have to see that. Now listen, I know that it's difficult to see that and understand that when the waves are coming over you and they're just pounding you. So I'm not a surfer, but when we lived in San Diego, um, the, uh, actually SEAL Team 6 was stationed there, and they said, let's go surfing, Pastor Ron. And I went out with a bunch of SEAL Team guys, and they were trying to teach me how to surf, and they said, dude, this is the wave to catch. I paddled, I got up on the wave, got up on the wrong part of the board, and I'm looking down at four Navy SEALs, right? And, and I'll never forget what these guys said. We get to the shore, and they go, Pastor Ron, we've been around the world, and we've been in all kind of battle and conflict, but we've never seen that kind of look of fear <laughs> like, we, like we saw on your face. Because I got up on the front of that board. If you know anything about when you get up on the front of that board, on the, and that was about at least an eight-foot wave, and I was on the front of that board, and I was just, and, the, and you know, they tell you to go in the turtle position, cover your head and all that, and I'm, and I'm doing that, and I'm getting beat and beat and beat by the board and by wave, and I'm going, where are the seals? Get me, you know, like, get me out. And I just felt like that moment, I felt like, God, you know, like, come. But it was just, it was seconds. 
But sometimes when you're getting beat up by waves, it feels like forever. But you have to understand they're not extreme but light. Number two, they're not inexplicable, but they are according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time, but let me just throw in a little parenthetical explanation on this one. That, does, that verse is not saying that it'll work out the way you wanted to work out, when you wanted to work out, for what you wanted to work out for. That is not a, and listen, I'm guilty of that as well. I'm guilty of praying to God. Like, God, I'm doing a whole lot of this, and there's not a whole lot of that, right? You've prayed that same prayer before. What he's saying is, is that in the grand scheme of things, what God is doing for you is he's using you at that moment to fulfill his will. Think about Haman. Think about Haman. If God could have looked at Haman and said, Haman, the reason why I did this for you is for thousands of years, people are going to read Psalm 88 and find themselves in your story. Haman said, God, get, get the, take this away from it. We will never know why God chooses some people to go through the dark nights and some people to live on the mountaintop. But we know that God's using Haman's story as he is now for the will of God to teach you and I how to make it when we walk with God. They are, number three, not humiliating, but actually elevating. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, we like the last part, right? But it's almost like, can we just put a little spiritual white out on the other part? Right? Like, God, God, I understand that when I'm weak, you're strong. But do I really have to go through weakness? Anybody wake up this morning and say, I hope I'm insulted? Anybody wake up and say, God, I pray to go through hardships, persecutions, and calamities? No, none of us would. But the point of what Paul is saying is at the end of it, I felt the power of God. I have felt the power of God. And you know, none of us likes the first part, but we would rather know that it's the power of God on our life rather than the power of self. We would rather know that at the end of the day, it was God delivered us through darkness than me that got me to the mountaintop. In the end, we, we, we actually want that. It's not humiliating, but elevating. Number four, it's not severe, but gentle. It's not in anger, but in love. First John chapter 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So we know that. We, we know His very character is that. So the darkness wants to come in and tell you that, that God is not loving, God is not caring. Listen, God cannot be anything other than what He already is. Which is what he means when he says, I am. It basically means, I cannot change. And so we know the very characteristic of God is love. So you have to immediately go to this when you feel like you're down in the pit. When the devil tells you God doesn't love you, God's not for you, God's against you, you have to tell yourself over and over and over, it is not of, uh, it is, God is of love and God is not against me in this matter. God is for me. It's not severe, it's gentle. It's not out of anger, but in love. Number five, it's not exhaustive. In other words... It, it has no end, right? It's what exhaustive means. It's, it's partial. It's partial. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. How many of us do that? I mean, on social media, all we see is what we're strong at. When's the last time you put on social media, I stink? You know, you know what I mean? And you, <laughs> I'll move on from that. You know what I mean? Right? He says, I'm going to, but why? Now, why does he choose to boast about his weakness? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Remember, God's kingdom is not a duplex, it's not two seater throne, it's only a one seater. And if I'm glorying in my strength, then I've sort of kicked God out and said, Well, God, will you join me? No. It's basically saying, God, I'm going to join you, is what Paul is reminding us here. Number two, and we're almost done, it's just two things from this powerful psalm. Number one, don't stop praying. Number two, don't stop praising. Don't stop praising the Lord. We learn that. Psalm chapter 88, verse 1. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. What he's basically saying is, God, I'm coming to you. And, and he's recognizing him. It's not out of anger. It's not some ethereal God that he hopes is out there. It's not a big man upstairs. Once again, what he's saying is he's actually expressing praise in the midst of a crying prayer. So here's what you have to know, right? Just because God is silent doesn't mean he is absent. 
just because God is silent doesn't mean He is absent. Now, we talked about this last week. We've talked about it before. It's in that faith gap between we feel like God has spoken something to us and then the reality of when that happens. It's in that faith gap that God chooses to grow us. But it's also in that faith gap that if I'm put in the pit and I feel that God is silent, then the enemy will come in and tell me, well, he's absent. And this is when you have to continually tell yourself, your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, that God, just because you're silent, you are not absent from me. Listen, praise may not do away with your pain, but it will bring you into the Lord's presence. That's why we do it. You didn't come here this morning hoping and knowing that all your prayers would be answered. I mean, you, you hoped, but you probably you knew that. You didn't come here this morning knowing that it was sort of the magic wand that you would leave here and everything's taken care of. You came here because, once again, you need to be reminded that it's in the presence of God is where I need to be. Because I know five minutes after this, I'm going to go back out into traffic and congestion and deadlines and demands and people and relationships. Those things are still going to be there. But it's all about gathering and praise to be reminded to be once again put back in His presence. Psalm chapter 22, Psalm 22, verse 3. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. What does that mean? That if we're not careful, we can enthrone our problems. We can enthrone our darkness. In other words, that can capture us more than the presence of God. But our praise actually puts God on the throne. And now we no longer see big problems and, oh God, where are you? Now we see a big God in problems. Oh, by the way, where are you? It just flips that script, if you will. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. A constant hum. The voice box is always moving. Wind is always coming through it. It's what keeps food out of it. <laughs> All right. It's always moving. And what is it moving with? The praise of God. One last verse. Psalm 146 and verse 2. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God. Watch. While I have my being. And by the way, Acts chapter 17, verse 28, my favorite verse in the whole Bible. In him we live and move and have our being. So what he's basically saying, watch this. Because I'm in you, I'm going to praise you because it's in you that I am. So I'm going to praise you. It's just reciprocal. And that's where we have to find ourselves. Haman is a wise man that went through a whole lot. He wrote down a song, sat on a stool, played a guitar, only one spotlight on him and said, if you've ever felt like this, don't stop praying, don't stop praising. It's how we get through the dark nights of the soul and bring glory and honor to God and stay in His presence. Amen? Thank you